Pedro from EMP Reacts. I'm here today with uh, Paulo from uh, Trivium. How's it going? Uh, going very well. Just, uh, you know, chilling, enjoying the quarantine. Hope you guys are doing good over there. Yeah, we're doing the same in Canada. We're, we're stuck at home, uh, you know, watching Netflix. Yeah, I mean, that's really all you can do at this point. And, you know, we, we got an album coming out, so it gives us something to kind of work with and something to do during the day. But uh, for the most part, just kind of chilling, doing what everyone else is doing. And that's why we're here to talk about the new album, What the Dead Men Say, uh, out next week, Friday, April 24th. Uh, you're excited about it. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, obviously, with given everything that's happening now, I mean, that's like really all we have to look forward to at the moment. But we are very excited to get it out. Um, we're very proud of it. We think it's definitely some of our strongest material. And, you know, I just can't wait till people hear it. Uh, we just released a song today called Amongst the Shadows and the Stones, and people seem to be really reacting well to it. Um, you know, I think uh, people are going to be in for a couple big surprises on this record. We got a lot of cool things for them. First question I have for you is, how the hell do you guys get in and finish all the tracking in 16 days? Uh, well, you know, the, the tracking was quick because we prepared a lot beforehand. Um, of course, me, Matt, and Corey started writing riffs like about a year ago, maybe a little bit longer. And then we did some demoing in March. We did a little bit more, um, I think we did some more in April, and then... We did some in August, and then right before we went into the studio. Uh, so we had about, like, three, four weeks worth of, like, pre-production stuff on our own before we ever hit the studio. So we were ready to go right away. We knew most of the parts. Most of it was pretty solidified. And because we prepared so much in advance, the tracking just was, like, very quick. Does this process work better for you guys versus going into the studio a little bit, working out the kinks inside and, and mm -hmm. some of the... Uh, going in with having uh, everything kind of pre-prepared is, is this a better yeah. way of approaching uh, a record in your opinion yeah i mean i think honestly that's the best way to do it i i mean bands that maybe can go in and do that in the studio either have a lot of time and money to to rent a studio or you know they're looking for someone to kind of like a producer that'll kind of help them figure out whatever sound they're looking for and for us we've always just realized that you know the best work we do is when we're in our rehearsal room in our warehouse wherever we've rehearsed over the years and just kind of like putting in the time and effort to really shape the songs get a good vision for what the song should be and then rehearse it until it's near perfect and that is what it takes for us this album to me, when I was listening to it, the first impression that I got was that it felt a little bit like a culmination of all the work that you guys put together in the previous eight records. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you agree with that statement that this album has a little bit of everything that you guys done before, but you took the best pieces possible of every single yeah. record leading up to it? Yeah, I mean, we definitely didn't like, I would say like the, the mission statement for like when we were going in wasn't to make it feel like the culmination of everything we've done, but it was really to follow up you know, what we started on the last record, which, you know, kind of set the template for how we recorded this one. But I do feel like, you know, with Alex in the band, he brings a sort of mastery to like his drumming and his capabilities that has some something that Trivium is just really, I feel like, you know, for people that have been with us for a long time, you know, maybe feel like has been lacking from maybe some of the records before this. And, you know, Alex's drumming is just on a whole nother level so i think it kind of pushed us to just really step our game back up with our writing and our riffs and you know all those records of course we wrote so you know those kind of riffs and those kind of ideas are things that are always a part of what we do but i think you know the situations now with alex in the band with josh an incredible producer it's just really allowed us to i don't know bring a lot of those elements back out to the forefront of the trivium sound um, and I think it does make it feel like a culmination of things. And it feels like, you know, when we're going to play one of these new songs next to anything from our previous records, you know, it'll stand up next to it just fine and fit in really well. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I feel like all the tracks on the album, you could almost close your eyes, pick any song. It's going to fit perfectly mm -hmm. on, on the set list, regardless of what song comes before or what song comes mm -hmm. after. Uh, it, will, it will have a way of blending it in. And, and the other aspect that I felt 
was that this felt a little bit like the sequence towards the sin and the sentence. Was working with uh, Josh Wilbert uh, allow you to kind of continue the work that you started with the previous record? Yeah, I mean, he definitely has a certain workflow to how he does things. Uh, the big difference from this record to the last record was that we did the drums last, and that was a really cool thing to kind of throw into the process. And, you know, it, we didn't really change too much, but changing that was actually, a, I think, a really nice thing, and it gave us a lot of flexibility uh, getting into the studio because if we had to change anything, we were always able to change stuff without messing with drum parts. Um, but Josh is you know, so good at production. He's so good at engineering and, you know, going right into this, this record, he knew exactly where to go with like tones and stuff right away. We weren't like, you know, w last record was really the, I, I guess it was like kind of like feeling each other out and getting used to each other's way of doing things. And this record was just like, okay, we know how to, to work together. Let's just go. And I think that's why it was even quicker this time. The album has a, also a very dynamic sound. Mm -hmm. Is that something that kind of worked itself out? Because uh, listening to some of the songs, you you guys almost start off in some tracks as a melodic death metal song, at least in terms of the sound, the feel. Yeah. Then it gets into a little bit of, of hardcore. Then you have like a, a bridge where it sounds almost like technical death metal. I mean, yeah. you guys are throwing curveballs at the listener, left, yeah. right, and center. Uh, that that approach to sound. Uh, was that something you guys really wanted from this mm -hmm. record or it was a combination of factors? Yeah, I mean, I guess like when I think about like what people love about Trivium or what people have told me they like about Trivium is just that we're a band that throws in a lot of unexpected things into our sound. And, you know, even going back to a record like Ascendancy, um, you know, there's a lot of things that you just aren't going to be expecting when you're listening to it because although we maybe came out when like the metalcore sound was big and that's definitely an element of our sound. You know, we do throw in a lot of more classic type stuff and a little bit of death metal here and a little bit of black metal there. And there's no real like formula of like what a song's going to have. And we're always excited to kind of see where it goes next because when we're writing it, that's kind of how we approach it when it kind of gets to a part and it feels like it needs something like, you know, the middle of what the dead men say being like this, you know, sort of melodic black metal type sound. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just felt like it needed to go there and we just kept pushing it and pushing it until it really turned into this really crazy part. And I love that sort of experimentation and I like taking chances with stuff like that. And I think that's what Trivium fans seem to respond to, you know. I think, um, of course, it's nice to be able to like step back and strip a song down, like Bleed Into Me and have this big grooving you know, lumbering song, but like playing fast and heavy and proggy is kind of like our, our wheelhouse. Yeah, the, the album definitely has a lot of curveballs. There's a lot of changes, a lot of dynamic mm -hmm. fluidity from track to track, but the album has great playability. W was overall, was there a song specifically on this record that you guys struggle with? Because I, I feel like the songs are really layered. There's a lot mm -hmm. to digest on every single track. So that is not something that it's really straightforward to put together. So in the studio, was there a song specifically that you guys had some troubles with? I mean, the song that probably took the most time uh, writing was What the Dead Men Say. And that was because, unlike the other songs, which kind of started from one demo, that was the product of two demos coming together. Because we jammed one day on a demo that Matt brought in, and we decided we needed more parts. So we came in the next day. I had some stuff that I you know, felt would fit with it very well. And we kind of had to make all these things fit and kind of see where things were going to go. Um, and that took about like two and a half days or so. But compared to the rest of the songs, that was like a longer process. But we put in a lot of time when we go into to jam. And, you know, we give it about four or five hours before we kind of call it when we kind of feel like we're a little burnt on ideas. And so, you know, that song, although the first day kind of kind of threw us for a loop where to go, once we kind of got the rest of the riffs, it was pretty easy to get together. And then when we came back for our second writing session and we jammed it again, we tightened it up even further. Uh, the Sit in the Sentence was such a, an incredible album. I, I don't think anybody looks back at that album in the year that was released and doesn't say that that's their favorite album of mm -hmm. the year. Th did that add extra pressure for you guys going into the studio for this one? Yeah, I mean, I think it was a good pressure. Um, but we knew in advance that we weren't going to try to throw – you know, a curveball of like a sonic change or anything. And of course, working with Josh again, having Alex in the 
band, you know, permanently with us. It gave, I think, things a sense of stability, and um, we wanted the the record to feel like a true follow up. And you know, we felt like that record really brought this sort of like interest and momentum back into Trivium. So we didn't want to like mess it up by trying to do something really wacky or, or different. We wanted it to feel like a continuation. And of course, I also think that's part of going back to the whole thing of like feeling like a culmination of sounds, you know, and that's what we want people to feel when they hear records, especially this far into our career. You know, I want people to hear it and be like, yeah, that's that's what I want from Trivium. That's the stuff I'm I'm after. You, you guys are like a fine wine, you know what I mean? Yeah. You guys get better with age. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's like, you know, we're in a genre that allows that. You know, there's not many genres that are like looking at bands, uh, albums nine, uh, eight and nine and being like, wow, this is getting cooler and getting better. And, you know, it's not a quick turnover with metal. You got to put in a lot of time. And, um, you know, we've been on tour, you know, for the last 15, 16 years. So we've uh, we've put in a lot of time. And uh, I, I think that the writing has definitely gotten to a point where we know what to do and we know how to like write and demo that it's just like we get in there and have fun and just see where it takes us. And, you know, the last two records, I feel like this record and the last one really kind of speak for themselves with that. Uh, by the way, I was really happy that I got the chance to sit down and talk to you because when I was listening to the album, I was like, wow, these guys did not skip on the bass. This is definitely not <laughs> Justice for All. No there's way. A of, there's a lot of bass on this record, and that's absolutely phenomenal. W were you happy with how much bass? Mm. Some tracks that the bass almost overshadows uh, the guitars. It's just so predominant. Yeah. It's such a dark feel to the tracks. Uh, are, are you happy that they allow you to come yeah. out of the shadows as a bass player and kick some ass? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I think most of that goes to Josh as a mixer. He's just, he's incredible, like, getting such clarity and separation in the mix that, you know, I feel like no matter what, like, that's really what it comes down to. Like, my bass tone on this record is what I do live. It's a Kemper. It's my Warwick. It's like a EBS compressor. It's very simple. Um, it's the, the tone I like the most. And I really just, this time I was like, I want to just use that. I don't want to use anything else. And it sat really great in the mix. And, you know, it just happens to have this sort of tone that like lives in its own space and with the guitars and the drums, you know, it all kind of fits together. And it's nice to just listen to a record. You don't even have to turn it up. I can listen on an iPhone you know, with the speakers and I like hear everything so clear and, you know, it comes down to Josh just being such a great mixer and, you know, not being afraid to put the bass up in the mix, you know, of course it comes down to just the performance and making sure the tone's good. But of course, you know, the levels come down to what he thinks is right. And, uh, I didn't have to say anything. I don't tell him to turn it up or down. I'm just like, Josh thinks it's good. That's where it is. Yeah. So I, in my opinion, some songs really call for it. They really needed it because it kind of, It, it, it set the tone. It gave a nice underline to the track. It mm -hmm. gave some darkness to the songs because there's some songs on the album while having a lot of energy and aggression. They're, they they have a little dark undertone to it. Yeah. And in yeah. Theory, the bass really helps push a little bit of that darkness forward. Yeah. When it's a slower song, the bass and low end just really fills up the space. I mean, you know, that's like kind of always the trade off with fast songs and with like mixing fast and slow. It's, You know, there's just a certain, um, you know, quality to like a fast song that kind of sucks up the low end because it doesn't have time to like resonate. But like with a big song like Bleeding to Me or Scattering the Ashes, you know, that's where the bass shines. It's just full on, full tone. You can hear every little aspect of it, all the dynamics. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really great to hear on big studio speakers or just nice headphones. It just fills it up. One of my favorite tracks is Sickness Unto You. I When I was listening to the album and that song mm -hmm. came on, my wife thought I had lost my marbles because <laughs> I, was, I was sitting here at the table and I'm just like singing along and, and, and just going absolute nuts. It's like my absolute favorite track on the record. Awesome. Can you can you let me know a little bit of the behind the scenes of yeah. how that track came about? Because I honestly, I love the yeah. whole album. But if you force me, put a gun to my head, <laughs> force me to pick one. To me, I'm going to go yeah. down. Wow. Um... Well, that one came in, uh, you know, that's a, a demo Matt brought in. And, um, you know, obviously, I feel like a real uh, way to tell if it's a Matt song is like a lot of the triplets uh, on the guitar riffs. And, um, 
you know, that, that one from day one, we knew it was going to be a heavy one, a fast one. And uh, that it was just fun to kind of write that one because it's like one of my favorite things with rehearsing is like you get a good riff, like the main riff of uh, Sickness Unto You when it comes in with the verse, like where it gets thrashy. And, um, you know, the, the way we kind of work about with that is like, you know, we jam the riff and then we kind of break it down uh, to a different version of the riff where it has singing over it. And then we have another version that kind of like when it all comes back in together and it's like you have three versions of the same riff essentially that kind of come from jamming. And I feel like we've just kind of learned this over the years. And, you know, when I listen to bands like Metallica and stuff, talk about how they write their songs, you know, that's like a a thing you kind of pick up on is like they take a main riff and then they break it down and then they bring it back, but a little different. And it's like a way to kind of get a lot more out of like just one idea. And then from there, it's like, you know, we do the same riff by riff, like the pre-chorus maybe has a couple different turnarounds to it. The chorus has some different stuff, um, you know, with vocals, with lyrics. And then the middle, it was just kind of this like riff off. It was just like, you know, let's make this part just crazy. The the riffs, the lockups, the the progressive crazy drum parts, the breakdown, the kind of almost rush type breakdown. I mean, we came up with that in the rehearsal. That wasn't even in the demo. And that was just sort of like, let's just see what happens. You know, let's take this the song in some wild directions and see if we can actually tie it up and get it back to where it's got to go at the end. And a lot of times that's like the most fun part about writing is like, you're like off in the deep end by the middle and then you got to figure out how to stick the landing. And that is, it's always tricky, but it's fun because you end up coming up with some sort of wild ideas like that. And with the album coming out, uh, April 24th, uh, and you guys have a tour schedule for America. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Like, are, are you guys concerned of the possibility of the tour mm-hmm. not being able to go through with everything that's happening? Yeah. Um, the tour is definitely going to happen. Um, I don't know if it's going to happen on schedule. I'm I'm kind of like, at this point, I'm pretty much resigned to the fact that, like, things are going to change. Uh, and there's really no way around it. And especially every day when, like, you know, different states and stuff are like, hey, we're not having shows here until this date or that date and it keeps getting pushed back further and further and the unknown of like the virus um you know and the knock-on effects of like the economy kind of catering around it it's kind of hard to think that like a tour will go ahead this summer uh as normal but um you know that tour is going to happen because it's a great tour it's a great lineup it's just going to have to happen when it's safe and you know We don't know when that's going to be. And really, it kind of comes down to Live Nation because it's they're the promoter of the entire thing. And um, they have to kind of make that call at the end of the day. And, you know, we're kind of just sitting back and waiting to hear what the plan is. Well, I got two tickets and I'm going to be there whenever whenever it happens. Yeah, Uh, it is going to happen. I mean, that is on to me. I, I couldn't see it getting canceled. And from what I've heard from people is that the worst case scenario is that it gets moved to other dates. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. With, with the, with the whole virus and the situation that we're in, uh, are you guys planning on doing perhaps some live streams or anything Mm -hmm. like that? If if the whole lockdown happens and you guys can't get there on the road, or do you guys have like a plan B, uh, in order to get uh, some exposure? I mean, um, I mean, of course, I mean, Matt's been streaming on Twitch for like the last three years. So, you know, we've been experimenting with that. We've done about 90 shows streamed on tour before. So we have the capabilities to do it. Um, You know, we had a couple ideas of what we wanted to do for release week. But what sort of, um, you know, dictated that was just the travel situation and just the unknown of like what's safe or not to do. Um, But I think in the next month or two, as we kind of see what the plans you know, in the States and in, in, you know, travel wise are, you know, whatever they end up being, we're definitely going to get back together and start rehearsing again in Orlando. Uh, and if big events aren't happening like tours, you know, we'll definitely do stream shows and we have a lot of plans and ideas around that, but it's kind of one of those things we got to just first see if it's safe enough for everyone to travel. I live in Chicago Alex lives in Modesto, California, so we can't really 
you know, get up on a plane right now until we know it's at least safe enough for us to do some like basic travel like that. Right. But, you know, if plan B is definitely stream shows and do whatever we can, stay in touch with fans and keep the album alive while we wait to tour. I, I, as far as keeping the album alive, I don't think you guys are going to have a problem with that whatsoever. The album is going to speak for itself. And uh, I, I, I can tell you that it's absolutely an incredible record from top to bottom. Thank you. So so I, I don't think you guys are going to have any problem. I, I think the only problem you're going to have is when you finally get on the road, mm -hmm. the demand for the tickets is going to be so high. <laughs> you, you may have to go on, on two runs of the tour. Yeah. People will be hungry to see well, Trip. I, I definitely hope so, you know, and... I hope it's not a long time until that, but, um, you know, the worst case scenario, if it is a long time, you know, we're going to all really have a good, good time when we do get back together and, you know, we're going to play as many songs as we can for sure. Yeah. With well, the festival season's pretty much canceled already. Yeah. Things look kind of, uh, really, uh, Grim. Really, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and for you guys as professional musicians, yeah. you have a lot to worry about as well. Cause you really depend on, on being on the road. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it is, uh, it is sort of a hit to the entire industry. I mean, really top to bottom, like from the corporate uh, behemoths like Live Nation and AEG all the way down to local venues, local promoters and, you know, all the bands and stuff in between. It's uh, it's definitely a shock to the system. And, um, you know, hopefully we can kind of figure out ways around it. And, of course, people that are helping out bands, people that are helping us out buying the album, streaming, buying merch, I mean, you know, it's so appreciated because it's uh, this is all we have right now. And, uh, you know, I know it's tough for people out there. So we really appreciate that. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to speak with me today about the record. I, I want to congratulate you one again on, on the incredible album you guys put together. Best of luck with the release Thank on you. April 24th. And, uh, and let's stay in touch. I'll, I'll see you guys when you guys hit the yeah. road here in Toronto. Definitely, man. Thank you so much for having me on. And uh, thank you to everyone for, you know, checking out the record, listening, supporting us. You know, we really appreciate it. And we hope everyone stays safe out there. Yeah, you too, man. Stay safe. Thank and, uh, you. And uh, we'll see you soon. Definitely. Thank you very much.